Kachuk. I'm Mike from the Nerds of Color. How are you? <laughs> I'm very well, Mike. Lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you, too. Um, let me just start out by saying I love this show. I was geeking <laughs> out about it just like a couple of seconds ago. Uh, and I love Byrne. He's such a good character. You did. You brought him to life in such a brilliant way. Um, so oh, congratulations. You. You, you are really, truly brilliant in this. Um, thank you. I, I wanted to start out by asking, how did you first get involved with James and with Peacemaker in general? You know, it was your standard thing. COVID was ending. Well, <laughs> the first <laughs> round of COVID was ending and it was one of those. I got an email from my wonderful agents at Gersh and um, saying, uh, you know, look at these sides for this project with James Gunn and all that. And I looked at the sides, it was just three pages. Most of it was, you know, they sort of make up sides so you don't know what's going on, very secretive. And I looked at it, I was like, well, I'm not, I saw the breakdown for the character. I was like, I'm probably never gonna get this. Why don't they just go hire Lance Henrik or someone? That's who should be playing this, you know, <laughs> and stuff. But then I read the material and it was so hilarious. It was so funny. And the actor in me was like, I can't pass up the opportunity just to play with this for a while. So. My wife and I set up the camera and we did the take. We did it in one take because it was so funny. And I said, send it because I didn't think I was going to get it, but at least I've had fun with it. And like a week later, a few days later, you know, I found out that James saw it and loved it. And um, I got the gig without ever meeting James. He just wow. loved what I did with it and he changed the, the, his idea of what he thought the character was and was like, oh no, you're the guy. So that's how I got involved with James. I mean, it was one of those things actors, you know, you just, you wake up one morning, you have your breakfast, you do an audition, then your life changes. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, like, if if your audition was anything like what we see on the show, it's completely understandable why <laughs> automatically he just depict you. You're you're so well, good. He was saying, oh, "Thank you, really, thank you." But it, Mike, it means a lot to me. You're saying that, but it was yeah. He said it was so weird. It's like he had a completely different idea, but then he saw my take and was like, oh, I, that's how I want to do it." You know, and so that in a weird way it was completely different but exactly what he wanted in a weird way yeah <laughs> um how long I, I gotta ask this because to me it's i'm not exaggerating or saying anything like completely you know uh, scripted this is the, it ha, this show has the most glorious opening credits in the history of television <laughs> uh and it I, does. Have, I have to ask how did how long did it take you to rehearse that and execute it um Carissa, who is, who's a, you know, choreographer, was just extraordinary. I think about, it took a while from, we had gaps, right? From when she first showed what was going to happen and you have your miniature meltdown and panic. And then you practice, we practiced for like an hour or two, like a couple of hours. Then you went away for like a week or 10 days to practice it. Then I had another, I think I had about two or three rehearsals and then it was time to shoot. So a lot of homework was done. Um, but yes, it was nerve wracking because you're just like, this is crazy. I, when you sign, how do you sign up to a project like that and end up doing what we do in the opening credits? So we don't want to spoil it for people who haven't seen it, but it really was, uh, what I'm going to do what? <laughs> I was, yeah. I, I had to watch it and I was just like, man, Chuck's got moves. Like, damn. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. You know what I mean? And it, only from the mind of James Gunn, yes. only from the mind of James Gunn can you decide to do that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, for fans who who love the the original movie, the Suicide Squad, like like mm. I did, um, mm -hmm. you know, you come into this project really expecting Mern to be very similar to Waller, to Amanda Waller, right. and I feel like you end this project thinking that they couldn't be more different. Um, how mm. how would you describe really the difference between you and Waller for for those who haven't seen the show or for those who are watching this? Um, well, not to like. Uh second guess what Viola, who's extraordinary in every beat of acting she does, is doing. But where we've seen Waller so far is this very, you know, cold, calculating, driven, sort of uh, Machiavellian leader. And there's a lot of Mer a lot of that in Mern. And as we know, his past is check his past in Black Ops and stuff. He has a reputation that comes with him. But what I will say is that over the course of this um, series, James gave him this amazing arc of a guy who's trying to redeem himself, who cares almost too much, who almost cares more than everyone else to the point where, uh, where he channels all of that experience and expertise into 
literally trying to save the world. And I think he has to be a taskmaster. He's very serious. He's a taskmaster. But he, it's driven by a guy who has a lot of heart because the humanity means a great deal to him. And that's his, in many ways, his tragic flaw. If you were talking in Shakespearean terms, it would be his tragic flaw is that it's this guy who could be a very cold, wonderful leader, but cares too much, you know. Um, and I feel that combination of a very recognizable trope, that sort of leader with a short fuse, but very clinical and whatever, combined with all the heart that James gives him is a very unique blend. We don't, we don't often see that actually. So that was fun. Yeah. It's, it's really hard to find the humanity in the character without an actor really embodying that spirit. And I think you inject that into Mern so much. Um, Thank and you, you. Really, you really end up loving him by the end of the show. So, so well done there. Thank um, you. I, I, I'm going to have to bring the mood down just a little bit. Um, so mm -hmm. because we're part of, I'm, I'm part of a blog called The Nerds of Color. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I really loved about this series was how it really tackles uh, racism and white supremacy, um, which, you know, admittedly, it's always been rampant, but I think things really got more blatant after uh, the U.S. elections in 2016, mm -hmm. for instance. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the show being a forum, to tackle these things head on is not only really bold, but really needed right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If this show could change the world today, to change the way that people think today, what specifically do you hope people take away from it? I think at the heart of this show is Peacemaker, right? It's named after him. And certainly the Peacemaker we met in the Suicide Squad is everything that's dangerous about America, you know, and everything that's dangerous about ideology and dogma and guns <laughs> literally and if we can take anything out of this show is to watch how this character evolves in trying to understand himself trying to recognize his trauma trying to see people actually see them it, james has paired him a lot with you know with danielle and the, the exactly the opposite the sort of image of two images of america right now john cena and danielle brooks <laughs> you know what i mean in that sense and everything in the middle you know and i think it's wonderful that um a character like him who james doesn't try to sugarcoat you know it's really important we don't dumb down the argument shows him for everything he is but you watch someone try to understand both themselves and the other and I think part of what's driven us into this black hole we're at is that people don't talk anymore. You know, people don't debate. People don't understand debate. Debate has now been equated into a fight. Mm -hmm. Debate has been reduced to argument. Not winning an argument has been reduced to something bad <laughs> as opposed to, okay, let me go and reassess. So I, I think if there's something that can come out of this show is watching a deeply flawed character who embodies a lot of America's flaws try to rediscover itself, re-question itself, open up itself and change. Mm -hmm. Because it, there's no point trying to pretend that change isn't needed. It, it's not, it, it isn't a case of it ain't broke. It, it's very broken. So it needs to be put back together again. And I think this show really does infuse so much humanity in very dangerous tropes. And the only way, I've always been brought up, um, some of the most, when I was growing in, I mean, growing up in Africa, my parents were the United Nations. We lived in Ethiopia, some of the poorest countries in the world. But there is something about humor in examining grief and uh, trauma. Is a lot of I, I know it was a lot of my Russian friends, the first generation Americans, but their parents who knew the Eastern Bloc and whatever the humor these people have in understanding the trauma they've dealt with sometimes when they talk to each other. And I think sometimes you've got to coat, you've got to figure out how you can feed us change without feeling like we're being lectured to. Because part of the problem right now is people don't get defensive straight away. Um, and I think a show like this is just perfect to make us go, God, is that really us? You know, that's my yeah. take on it. Yeah, yeah. It does it without being heavy handed. And yet yeah. it, it still gets the message across so clearly. It's not yeah. too subtle. Uh, but it's all it's in the most popular of American, you know, the, the, the superhero, 
in yeah. the most American way to get these messages across is quite awesome. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, a, a superhero from a huge brand like DC as well, you know, yeah. so that's, yeah. that's something yeah. that's very important. I love I love that. Yeah. And very well said. Thank you very much for that. Thank answer. you. Thank um, you. You have two of my favorite scenes of the entire series, honestly. Uh, I can't talk about what you do. Um, There's one in the beginning of Murn After Reading, which we can't talk about for obvious spoiler reasons, Um, but you act the living heck out of that scene. Um, And the other, which I think we can talk about, was just one of the scenes where I laughed the loudest. And it's just you staring down Steve Aggie for five minutes (laughs) or mouthing an expletive. (laughs) I love that man. First of all, Steve is one of the funniest beings I've ever been anywhere near. He's also, I mean, his delivery is, well, it was so surprising to me how easy it was for Mern in character to hate him so much because he keeps screwing up. And that scene, actually, the, the, that was, I believe that was episode four, right? I believe so. Mm-hmm. Episode four. So that was directed by um, Jody Hill. And um, I remember in that, you know, he he said to me at some point, he just said, just look at him through the window and just hate him. Just hate him. Just do whatever you want. Just show him you hate him. So, you know, James had written that I give him the stink eye. But I think he was the one that said to do the expletive. And all that. And he says, just go for it. And that was, I mean, the cameraman was shaking and laughing. The crew were laughing. I mean, there was the blooper reel that will come from that day we shot that. It's going to be quite, quite fun. <laughs> I loved it. It's, it's so yeah. funny. Um, yeah. we, we, we will have to wrap up soon. So I do have two questions for you. One might take a little longer than the other, but the other one's very, Good. very short. Um, my second to last question is mm-hmm. James has curated just probably as he always does, one of the best soundtracks um, for the show. Mm. Were there any, and, and there are so many brilliant obscure br- bands like Hanoi Rocks that I didn't know about or Wigwam mm. um, represented. Did he get you into any of that music um, that you weren't previously I, into? I, I can't think off the top of my head of any of those people I knew. I, I mean, look, look at me, I, I was not into... <laughs> I was not into that kind of music growing up, you know, but um, do you want to taste it? It's just for so many reasons by Wigwam. I mean, I sing, I, I've said that I now sing it in the shower a lot and it pisses my wife off big time So because I'm not a good singer. And she's like, that's just that imagery that comes from that song is crazy. So like, um, <laughs> but no, that's my favorite. I mean, but his soundtracks are just stunning. They get you going, they get you. And you know what people might not know is that on set, certain soundtracks he will play while you're filming. For instance, that scene in episode three where we come into the house, burst into the house. I mean, imagine your day is literally my second day of filming and you know, you're know you playing this cool guy and you walk on set, there's God knows how many people and that blasts through the speakers as you're walking into a room, clearing it. I mean, tell me about getting into character. That certainly <laughs> does it for you, you know? <laughs> Uh, absolutely. And I, I played the song on the loop, by the way, when I was in the shower this morning. So that's something. To <laughs> and my final question, because I can't let you go without asking this, and I'm pretty sure I know the answer already. Your next team up with James, Guardians Volume 3. Can you give us yeah. anything? <laughs> nope. <laughs> all I can say. It's going to be a quick can, one. Uh, uh, it's a quick note, but it's it's it's... It, you know, it's it's going to blow you away. I mean, I was a huge fan of the first two. I mean, as most people were, and this is just another level. It is his. It, it is his third act. It is his a proper third act, and I can't. All I can tell you, I am so excited for the audience to see this movie, and it's 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 it's, it's truly beautiful, and it, it has a sh- an incredible amount of heart. I mean, how he can do that take you. To these big worlds and then infuse it with something as domestic and natural as heart i don't know how he does it but he does it in this movie and i'm just so excited for you to see it i really am I, i'm excited to see it too there's very few people that can make me laugh and make me cry as much as james right. can within yeah, yeah. span of an hour um yeah yeah and, and i just want to say you and james make a great team and i know that everyone's going to see that too once they see peacemaker hitting hbo oh. max uh, january 13th Chuck, thank you so much for your time. Thank this you was for amazing. Having me. 
it was <laughs> such a joy. I, I hope to see you down the road. Let's uh, let you know in more normal times, Mike. Thank you for your for, thank you for having me on. I would love that too. Uh, thank you for being here. <laughs> Take care, mate. Okay. Take care. Fanboys, professional artists, and professors. Maybe a nerd who's just like you, talking about the things that you like too. So I invite you to the NOC in full color. You see me? The hard knock.